Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation and entrepreneurship. My name is Steve Glaveski and each week I'll bring you authors, corporate innovation managers, entrepreneurs and above all else, thought leaders on the topics of innovation, entrepreneurship and self-improvement. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you successfully navigate your innovation journey. Every Monday, I'll bring you a world-class thought leader such as Steve Blank, Alex Osterwalder, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, or Whitney Johnson, just to name a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you some quick digestible insights myself to help end your week on a high before you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is proudly brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub, school, and consultancy that works with large organizations to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies, and tools required to explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. If your organization needs support coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change, or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit Collective Campus online at www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared. Today I'll be speaking with Leslie Barry, currently the Head of Innovation at Sportsbet, Australia's largest online bookmaker with an operating profit of £79.4 million in 2015. He was previously the Head of Innovation at ThoughtWorks Australia, was the GM of Professional Services at Dimension Data Australia, and has also founded several companies including Exotac, a health and fitness tracking business acquired by Techstars alumni Jiminy in 2008, and Get Viable, an online innovation platform sold to Hong Kong-based Big Colors in 2011. He is an advisor to several startups including Scanned, Crowdsource Hire, and mentors at this year's intake at the Slingshot Startup Accelerator as well as maintaining a journal of his innovation journey at InsideInnovation.co. I've had the opportunity to meet with hundreds of innovation managers across a range of companies and speak with countless thought leaders on the topic. And Leslie is one guy who just gets it. To put it simply, Leslie avoids innovation theatre at all costs and has very little appetite for, lack of a better word, bullshit. In his brief time at Sportsbet, he has already had profound impact on the way the company approaches innovation, culminating recently with the ideation, design, development and release of a product in just 12 weeks, unheard of in the company previously. What makes it all the more impressive is that in 2015, Sportsbet's revenues grew by 54%. So navigating internal politics when things are rosy and stakeholders might see little reason to change is made all the more difficult. As you will all know if you've listened to this show before, I'm a massive advocate for the benefits of health and fitness, of body and mind on productivity. And we'll also dive into Leslie's approach to staying on top of his game. I simply can't say enough good things about Les, so without further ado, it gives me much pleasure to bring you the one, the only, Leslie Barry. Welcome to the show, Leslie. Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you on the program, Les, and we've caught up a couple of times in the past and had the pleasure to chat last week at the Melbourne Entrepreneurship Gala, and I find that our conversations on corporate innovation are always quite engaging, so keen to see where this one goes today. Me too. Looking forward to the day. It'll be a great chat. Firstly, everybody's talking about your fellow countryman Elon Musk's recent assertions that we might just be living in a simulation, yep. effectively avatars guided by creatures in another reality, where the exponential rate of improvement of technology has made games indistinguishable from reality. So, what are your thoughts? Are we living in a simulation, Les? It's, it's highly possible. So, I think it should be um, vain to assume that we're the first iteration of humanity, and given that we've been around for... X, X amount of years, couple of billion years. Um, is it not possible that we are just a simulation? Because if we were going to simulate things, we'd simulate them at scale. Um, so it's possible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope not, but it's possible. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be hard to imagine that if the exponential rate at which technology is improving yeah. continues for, say, the next 10,000 years, that future uh, civilizations may just get quite bored and start running simulations on um, other civilizations. Maybe that's us. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I mean, it takes someone like an Elon Musk to step out and pose such questions and then everybody else sort of sits back and starts pondering and says, oh, yeah, I mean, that could be possible. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, we won't digress too much from today's topic of conversation, but Les, you joined Sportsbet as the head of innovation in November 2015, so roughly uh, about nine months ago, um, just before the company announced a record $117 million operating profit, with revenues 54% higher than the previous year. So I guess the question needs to be asked, does Sportsbet need to innovate? Um, Absolutely. I I think one of the reasons I joined Sportsbet was 
because they're a high-growth technology company whose product happens to be wagering, and they've got the foresight to understand that they don't want to be the next Kodak. Um, one of the challenges about high-growth industry is it's okay if you're the only part person that's growing at that rate, yeah. but everyone else in the industry is growing at, this, at similar rates. Um, so that there's cash, there's opportunity. Our, our challenge is, isn't, a, isn't a lack of ideas, it's an abundance of ideas and understanding which ones to pick. So I think to have the, the foresight to go, we're growing like crazy, um, but what, what does this look like in three years' time? What does it look like in five, five years' time? Um, it's quite powerful. So was that a difficult conversation to have? I mean, Sportsbet obviously already had a mandate to innovate, but what I'm seeing with a lot of companies, Les, is that you know they hire um, chief innovation officers and heads of innovation and the like, but oftentimes these positions amount to nothing more than a bit of show. Yep. And when that head of innovation tries to do something, there's a lot of pushback. So what was that like for yourself? Um, I think they'd been on the journey about two years already in various forms as strategy and research and development and and trying things with Apple Watch and those mm-hmm. kinds of things. Um, uh, the, the, I think the challenge that I had was yep. to get the organization to take more risk than they thought they were taking. Mm. Um, so I obviously didn't do this single-handedly, but um, we often th- think that we're taking risk because we're doing it in the con- context of our known yeah. business. The challenge is to get the business to think about what risk could we take that's outside mm-hmm. the scope of what we know yep. um, and do that in a structured way. So there wasn't de- absolute appetite for it, but I think that I think like everybody, it's like how do you do this? How do you yeah. blend these startup methods and approaches and tools in a coherent way to drive actual results mm. and also take a longer term view? Mm. Mm. And um, on that, Liz, I mean, you've mentioned it's not really about ideas. I mean, that you've got more ideas than you know what to do with. Um, it's about picking the right ideas. So how do you go about doing that? Very good question. Um, what we've implemented internally, and it's evolving like these things are, is I've picked three of the startup methods that I found really powerful in a previous life. Um, the Lean Canvas from Ash, um, prototyping from Alberta Savoia from Google, um, as well as Dave McClear's Pirate Metrics. And if you blend those three things together, um, they give you quite a powerful way to rapidly iterate. So to directly answer your question, we use the Lean Canvas as a screening tool for ideas. And yep. it's we're finding it really powerful because... A, most people are too lazy to fill it in, so it kills yeah. half those ideas. Um, and B, those that do put it, fill it in are forced to take a customer perspective of yep. the world yep. and okay. uh, really think deeply about what they're proposing. Mm. Um, and then we use various methods, which, which we can go into around prototyping to filter it out, determine interest, etc. Yeah, and I love what you said there about being too lazy to fill out a lean canvas. Um, I think a lot of people are attracted to the idea of innovation and entrepreneurship, but ultimately there's a certain type of person um, that suits that type of role, someone with resilience, with tenacity, with the personal attributes to carry an idea through um, all the way. Um, and yeah, it's, it's funny when you run an innovation program, you get so many hands going up saying, I want to take part, but as soon as you ask someone, say, well you've got to complete a lean canvas um, with you know, summarizing what your concept is and the numbers just drop off significantly. Absolutely. Um, it's quite interesting how that happens. Um, but anyway, um, you mentioned earlier the topic of stakeholder buy-in, Les. Um, keen to hear what sort of challenges you had in this space. Um, I think the first, the first challenge was to let people understand what innovation actually is. Yeah. So my view, my personal view, mm-hmm. is I think you can innovate around your core business, but innovation isn't continuous improvement. Innovation yeah. is not, you can, it's better defined by what it isn't. Mm-hmm. It's not incremental improvements to existing products. In my mind, if you're doing it seriously and you really want to get that breakthrough or disruptive innovation, mm-hmm. you, I've had to convince the organization that we have to take an open approach. So how do we plug in startups, universities, events, all these things, plug the ecosystem into the business, mm. which is the one way. Um, the other thing is to be t- to take longer-term bets of things we don't understand. Yeah. Where around, if, if you innovate around the core, what you're doing is typically understand there's a competitive threat mm. or you're trying to drive growth. You understand what the solution could look like. Yeah. Um, what we're trying to do is go, what is – how do you identify emerging customers or emerging markets or emerging technology mm-hmm. where we understand the customer problem yep. and we start thinking how can we apply this solution to that, how can we apply this technology to that problem mm-hmm. and go on a journey to figure out the solution. I think that's the core difference um, and it's been quite a journey to 
roadshow around the business and let the business understand um, innovation is not a bunch of, like everybody thinks, kids in the corner playing with VR um, <laughs> yeah. with Nerf guns. You know, mm-hmm. Yes, we do that too, obviously, of course. <laughs> um, to get the creative juices flowing, but it, it, it isn't just that. And I absolutely love that the first thing you did was to define what innovation actually is. Um, you know, there's so many different interpretations of innovation, be it, you know, Horizon 1, um, incremental innovation, yeah. Horizon 2, adjacent innovation, and yeah. Horizon 3, disruptive innovation, which all require a very different approach. Um, yeah. And you mentioned um, long-term innovation, yeah. which brings with it more risk, uh, more uncertainty, yeah. and I guess, you know, aligning the... The long-term innovation with the internal metrics of success um, can be quite challenging Absolutely. for a lot of, um, you know, entrepreneurs. Yeah. So I'm keen to hear what those conversations uh, were like with um, senior executives, with accounting, um, with finance, and so on. Excellent question. So what we did is the the, the second thing was to redefine and create a common language. Mm-hmm. Um, so. The way we were measuring innovation before was exactly that, the core business metrics, which is, I don't believe, the right way. So if yeah. you look at the McKinsey's through Horizon, a piece of work I did at ThoughtWorks was we created a model to simplify that called explore, exploit, and sustain. Mm-hmm. So the reason and part of that is if you create, if you accept that as the model in the organization, yep. um, explore, all you're trying to do is measure problem-solution fit. Mm-hmm. So the outcome is problem-solution fit. Yep. It's not a metric. It's not a financial metric, but it is measurable. Mm. Um, in exploit, we're talking about um, product market fit mm-hmm. in, in lean language, and then sustained is the normal business metrics. So I went on a, in another internal bit of a roadshow to um, <clears throat> explain the model to everybody, um, and we accept that there's a way to do things. It's a really simple language. Mm-hmm. Um, and now it's easy to have a conversation to say, in explore, our objective is to fail 90% of the time. Because Love for that. every failure... We're saving a few million dollars, but not building stuff that we shouldn't be building. And the risk, we can take much more risk for much lower price. Yeah, and I absolutely love that 90% failure metric, Les. I mean, it makes sense because if you set that failure bar, well, lower, I guess it just means that you're not aiming high enough. Um, I mean, if you look at VCs, they tend to get it right one out of every 10 times. And that's essentially their business is to invest in early stage disruptive innovation, which is fraught with risk. Um, and I also like this concept of explore, exploit, sustain, and tying that into you know, those pirate metrics, Dave McClure's pirate metrics of um, problem solution fit, product market fit. Um, you know, we do a lot of stuff here at Collective Campus where we may test um, a problem by setting up some ads, say, on Facebook, which clearly um, stipulate what the problem is. Like, for example, no time to work out, um, click here. Um, and then testing the solution with a landing page. So is is that the kind of thing that you guys are doing? Or what does your uh, interpretation of that look like? Absolutely. So initially our thinking was um, lean canvas and in exp- to measure explore or to run explore yeah. mm-hmm. and pirate metrics in the exploit phase. Right. Um, after a visit to um, Alberto Savoia in, um, at Stanford um, mm-hmm. who's de- who – developed a prototyping methodology for Google, yep. we injected that into the process because that was the missing step. The missing step mm. was how do we very quickly evaluate in 24 hours what the initial level of interest is? Yep. Um, and that works really well. But back to your question, mm-hmm. uh, that then gives us a filter to drive uh, ideas into the predat- sorry, excuse me, mm-hmm. into the exploit phase. Yep. Um, and in the exploit phase, we use Dave McClure's pirate metrics mm-hmm. because uh, we do... Very simple things in our customers, which has been a quite a step, quite a leap for the business to go. Yeah. Everything we put out there isn't 100% perfect. It's yep. okay to experiment on 0.1% of our customers. We've got hundreds of thousands of customers, so we can do this. Um, we can get product in front of them or potential product in front of them in terms of Facebook ads or those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and then measure it on the pirate metrics. And the pirate metrics, the beauty of that is once again, you change the metric conversation from what is the absolute number to what is the week-on-week growth? Because yeah. at this point, yeah. when you're growing a product or launching a new idea or testing a new idea, all you care about is week-on-week growth, nothing else. Yeah, and on um, Pirate Metrics, I um, interviewed uh, David Benetti way back when. I think it might have been episode number seven, six months ago or so. Um, and he came up with this framework called Innovation 
options, um, which essentially takes the stock options framework and applies it to innovation so that at the early stage of the innovation lifecycle, you can actually apply, based on a set of underlying assumptions being either validated or invalidated, um, a value which you can then use to uh, communicate to accounting. Because accounting, yeah, they may say, great, you've got all these learnings, uh, problem, solution, fit, and so on, but ultimately they want to see numbers. So keen to hear how or what rather that conversation sounds like at Sportsbet. Um, we have managed to successfully defer that conversation. Excellent. Um, and the way we've done that is to give the business a sense of trust in the process mm -hmm. and the fact that the numbers are coming back are absolute numbers. So yep. we've got a this, these hippos that we pan out in conversation in the business, and the hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. It's yep. a stress toy, not an actual hippo, of course. Um, <laughs> Well, it might be a bit of an OHNS hazard <laughs> if we had actual hippos running around the office at Sportsbet. <laughs> and the reason we do that is, is to have the conversation around, it's got nothing to do with anyone's opinion. I don't care about your opinion at all, and I really don't. I care about the data that comes back. People trust data, and the data, is coming, data coming back shows growth week on week, and we are actually acting on that data and killing things, which we've done. Um, there's a level of comfort with people or with parts of the business that are looking for those absolute numbers. Of course, we commercially aware. Of course, we're running it as lean as we can. Of course, we're spending the least amount of money as we can. Of course, we want commerciality. But I think if you have the commercial conversation too early, you'll kill potential outlier ideas that have some upside. So, yeah, I mean, a couple of important things you've touched on there. Um, one is that week-on-week -week growth. Um, yeah. It's obviously critically important to define your baseline, you know, where your starting point is to be able to demonstrate um, that growth back yeah. to stakeholders on a week-by-week -week basis. Um, and also, number two, um, when do you kill an idea? Um, do you give yourself, say, four weeks to test something, or is that then taking away from the possibility of, say, finding product market fit in six months? I mean, how do you make that um, judgment. Yeah, judgment call on when do you pull the plug on an idea? Um, two examples. So the one is we've killed a few at that prototyping phase, which is between a day and a week long, um, where we test initial level of, int level of interest and ongoing level of interest. The way we did that is prototyping is quite a robust method. Um, I can talk, can't talk about the specifics, but we had an internal idea around geolocation. Excuse me. Uh, an internal idea around geolocation. And uh, we the way we tested it was very simply. We, we mocked it up. We distributed it to the business. And they uh, everyone came back, that's awesome. It's cool. We'd love to have this, which everyone says. Your friends always love you. Like, don't test with your friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we got them to get some skin in the game, which was, come to a two-hour workshop where we're going to labor through this and teach you more about it. And like three people showed up, so we killed the idea <laughs> because there was no interest in the idea and we knew and we, it was a good enough indicator for us around how we could drive it forward. A um, bit more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. The second one mm -hmm. is in progress. So we've launched an eSports site called Respawn. Yep. Um, it's one of the first sites in the world that where we do combined streaming with wagering with mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. um, and that's three months into a six or nine month test. You know, it, the business probably doesn't like to hear this yeah. because we've invested time and effort and, and resource around it. But yep. in my mind, we're in the exploit phase, yep. and we are testing and mm -hmm. we're measuring week on week growth. It's going f fantastically at the moment, mm -hmm. so I think it's going to make it. But we could kill it next week. We could kill it in six months' time. Mm -hmm. So, for those in our audience who don't know what esports is, essentially, we're talking video games as a spectator sport. That's right. Competitive video gaming. Much much like Twitch runs with 225 million viewers around the world. Yeah, it's definitely um, a fast emerging space. And I know you recently ran an esports event on the premises there at Sportsbet. Yeah. And um, from what I understand, there were a few skeptics turning up. <laughs> and um, very quickly, that skepticism turned into um, optimism. Yeah. Um, so keen to hear a little bit more about that. <laughs> it's a really good experiment. So what we do in Sportsbet is when we launch new products, we have an internal activation event. We hired in uh, one of the top uh, esports gaming teams uh, for a day or two in the, in, in the organization. We had yep. 16 teams competing, mm -hmm. including our executive team. Um, and the reason we did it, well, the side effect of doing it, we did it so people could get a sense of what this thing is and really internalize it. Um, and it was interesting to watch the skeptics walk into the room and within 15 or 20 seconds, 
they were screaming at the screens mm. about headshots and all these things were playing yep. Counter Strike Go. Yep. And you could see that conversion happen. And it was that moment of of empathy because you can't deny the energy and the focus. And suddenly the yeah. penny drops where it's the same as being at a footy game or at a basketball game. So I guess the lesson there is essentially show, don't tell. Absolutely. And the thing with esports is it's not like, um, yeah, you know, we get people together and they play video games. It doesn't sound as compelling as actually showing people and immersing themselves in the experience, especially when there's money on the line. Yes, absolutely. It's an entirely different value prop. Yeah. And it's similar to like Steve, Bank, Steve Blank's get out of the building principle, which I'm a big fan of. We just got everyone into the building um, with an outside view. <laughs> Maybe that should be the title of your next blog post. Get into, into the building. <laughs> we'll send that one to uh, Steve for uh, his perusal. Um, but anyway, one of the um, things I wanted to touch on today, and it seems to be you know the bane of existence for many innovation managers, and it's getting around IT. Yeah. You know, when it comes to innovation, we want to try and move quickly. We want to run a lot of experiments and so on. But essentially, IT will say, well, look, we can't host this in the cloud. It's got to be hosted on our own servers or, you know, it's too risky if we do this. It's, yeah. it's a risk to our HR systems, to our financial systems and so on. And um, can you hear how you went about navigating um, this particular hurdle? Um, I think it's setting expectations and being respectful of what the other part of the business is trying to do. So one of the first conversations with um, the senior leaders of IT was to acknowledge that we're always going to be in conflict. So in very simple terms, IT's job is to keep everything stable. Yep. Innovation's job is to break shit. <laughs> so our job is to break stuff as fast as we can yep. and learn, um, but not break the business. So mm -hmm. we, we never put the business at risk. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. There's no reason to do that. We are high-risk, high-trade business. We regulated. We can't do those things. Yep. Um, but there is a place in the middle. So what we're doing as an experiment on ourselves is, Respawn is a great example, mm. um, is working with IT to see what is the fast track process of this. So what is the minimum viable product of IT compliance, yeah, to use some mm. buzzwords, yeah. um, that we can put in place? Uh -huh. So how do we get this through the system as fast as we can without breaking things? What is the work we can do up front to make their jobs easier? And, it ha and everyone is willing and able to do it. We just are challenged by uh, the realities of the business. You know, yep. Innovation will never be a priority in the business yeah. it, it, from an IT perspective. Keeping everything stable, not breaking stuff is the priority. And mm -hmm. it's absolutely right. So of course. It, it's really a matter of just working through that and, and doing it by example and thinking of smart ways that you can test things without impacting the core infrastructure. Yeah, and I love that approach. It kind of reminds me of... Um William Urey's Getting to Yes, yeah. um, where essentially it's all about negotiating over interests, not positions as such. Yeah. So does that mean that you're now testing or running these experiments in the cloud? Um, some of them where it makes sense. Um, some of them on microsites. Some of them, I think the core thing to remember is it doesn't, you don't have to build anything to test stuff. So we mm. always go, what is the absolute least we can do yep. to test if customers care? Mm. And whether that's a you know, hitting our social channels, yep. whether it's going down to a pub to test things, uh, which is always good, <laughs> <laughs> um, whether it's using microsites to build things as we've done. With, yeah, we, we, do, we do use every channel we can, which has the lowest impact on the business yep. and gives us the quickest result. And that's the thing about prototyping. Um, you know, People have this misconception that well, you're going to have to go out and spend ten or twenty thousand dollars to build a prototype. When really, um, you can use off-the-shelf or cloud-based software like a, an Instapage to to test um, whether customers care. Absolutely. Um, or you know, Google Glass. Their first prototype was set up in a day using existing um, resources and existing products. So it doesn't need to cost a lot of money to to test those metrics that matter. <laughs> So at this point of the podcast, I just had to ask Leslie a question that you as my audience members will know um, is one of my pet peeves and also one of his. And this is about the topic of innovation theatre. And so I was keen to find out what Leslie does to avoid falling into the trap of innovation theatre and just being another innovation manager who, say, runs hackathons but nothing ever comes from the prototypes or runs an innovation contest and the quantity of ideas is valued over the quality of ideas and so on. So this is Leslie's response. So as I said when I joined the organization, um, I am yet to make an impact on the business and do this with authenticity and the right intent. 
and innovation theatre is one of my my hot buttons. Um, what we see in, in the Australian innovation ecosystem is a lot of organisations are. I think chasing KPIs or trying to look good or trying to be the new rock stars or, or latching onto this new innovation buzzword and it's in everyone's KPIs and that's great. But what I think there's a lot of damage being done by going through the motions. It's you know, you can set up an innovation hub, you can hire people in, you can convert no disrespect, but you can convert people that don't have deep um startup experience or haven't built businesses, um, internal people into these roles. Um and firstly, they don't know what they don't know. But secondly, we see a lot of the short-term thinking taking place. We're pumping lots of money in, looking all shiny, running internal accelerator programs, doing all, all this stuff. The, the simple question to ask is, what is the outcome? What is the result? What are you doing to the ecosystem? How are you supporting them? And I think it comes from misunderstanding. It's, it's from my perspective, um, why do I do this? I do this because I deeply believe that I want to connect startups to business. And I think startups, of course, they need cash. But more than that, they need access to our scale and our customers yes. so yes. that they can grow their business. They don't want to work for us. There isn't a secret formula to create the new Uber or the new Spotify or the yeah. new, you know, one of those new companies. Yeah. Um, the flip side of that is also true. We benefit greatly from supporting the early stage ecosystem mm -hmm. because that's where the left, cent left to center thinking is coming from. That's where the innovation is coming from. Yeah. So... To do that with authenticity, you need to respect that part of the ecosystem, mm -hmm. not be looking at it as what are the steps we can go through to make it look like we're doing innovation to pretend that we're generating things. Yeah, and I absolutely love what you said there about the steps that organisations go to to um, or go through to um, make it look like they're doing things. Um, you know, for example, running startup boot camps so they they can then go on and publish that as part of their annual report and show the shareholders that hey, look at us, we're being innovative. But um, ultimately, there's no real focus on the long term, what comes out of those boot camps? Essentially, it's usually a marketing exercise. Um, yeah, you know, there's no real focus on progressively changing the culture. There's no focus on aligning the metrics, the processes, the systems, the values um, with an environment that will actually support that uh, Horizon Three disruptive innovation. Uh, and I really, I love what you said there because there's this short termism because because startups are seeing or perceived on TechCrunch, whatever your favorite mash order is. Yeah, to go like you know, overnight success. These guys exited for a billion dollars, etc., and those are pumped up. Those are the, absolutely the out, outliers, so you can't use them as, as the norm. And you talk to any venture capital fund, they run their funds for seven years, they don't expect an exit before that. Everything runs on a five to seven to ten year cycle, and it's still true. That hasn't changed. Mm. So to play innovation, innovation for a year, and then go, whoops, that failed, yeah. and then kill the program, yep. you're doing more damage than good, I think. Yeah, and you're exactly right. You know, when it comes to the VCs um, with the seven to ten year sort of investment cycles, um, you know what they're doing now is essentially setting up funds of funds where um, they have between say 100 and up to maybe 300 startups um, by partnering with other venture capitalists, essentially increasing the likelihood of success, decreasing the risk. Um, Hedge your bets. Yeah, essentially hedging their bets and. I guess we're seeing the opposite of that in many um, large organisations, and I'm, I think it's a throwback to the the legacy of the 20th century, where um, you know comprehensive planning, yeah. um, conditions that weren't changing as quickly as they are today, um, and I guess you know when you when you're confident of what the schedule is, how long yeah. how long it's going to take to deliver, how much it's going to cost, etc. But that just doesn't apply today when technology is changing as much as it is, as quickly as it is. Um, yet what we're seeing is companies are still applying that same sort of lens of certainty to um, the exploration of Horizon 3 disruptive innovation, yeah. maybe investing in one or two startups. And then if that doesn't work, well, it's okay. The, the experiments fail. They just pull the plug and continue doing what we were doing before. And I think the biggest myth is that this is a process. So this, I'm not being critical of corporate innovation. I think there's a lot of good stuff going on. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of short-term thinking and um, misguided thinking. So it's, it's really – I don't think everybody – it might be controversial, but I don't think everyone is a little innovator. I don't think you can take innovation approaches embedded in the business and suddenly everyone can innovate. I think you need special kind of people that are free thinkers, that are, that are given the space and time and resources to be able to do this in a structured way um, and and enough time, I think enough time to do it. And, and one of the possible outcomes, I mean, we want to, we, we come from this factory mindset, we put something in the front of the process and something pops out the back. 
I don't think the space works like this. I think the, one of the likely outcomes in what I'm doing is 100% of things fail. And that should be okay to some extent, as long as you're not being, as long as it's aligned to the strategy and, and, and what you're doing with the business. Yeah, and on, on that, I mean, there's a number of benefits that come with that, essentially people embracing, um, taking smart risks and essentially stepping outside of their ego where they're essentially scared to say things or do things for fear of um, looking silly or, or yeah. <laughs> um, and embracing failure. So on that, I want to talk about yes. the fail button. So um, legend has it, Les, that you run around the sports bet offices like a mad scientist pressing a fail button whenever someone in your team essentially fails. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, absolutely true. So I think everyone, we conditioned to put on the, regardless of what stage of your career you're at, to put on this pose that we everything's under control all the time. And it absolutely isn't. Everyone's kicking like ducks under the water. Um, so to encourage that, and particularly in the innovation space, um, when I joined there, I wanted to create the environment that failure is okay. And by failure, I don't mean being stupid. By failure, I mean taking risk. If, if we're not failing enough, we're not taking enough risk, as we know. So I got a fail button that you, you push it, it goes, ah, makes the fail sound. Can we hear that one again? Uh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> And um, the, the way I tried to get the culture going inside the, the, the innovation area was um, asking every day, what have you failed at today? As a moment of pride, was you taking risk? And it, I got resistance for three or four weeks. And eventually one of the guys turned me in and he said, yeah, I've screwed up five times before lunch today. And that was like almost a tipping point where we demonstrate that. And now what happens is people will go like, where's the fail button? Walk in and push the fail button with a sense of pride. So it's just a symbolic way to to celebrate that we're taking risk. So with those failures, Les, um, do you have a process in place to share those failures, um, not only so they don't happen again, but to also build upon those learnings? Absolutely. So we communicate on a regular basis around what those failures are, what we learned out of those failures, and they're not really failures. So Mark Andreessen says the goal is not to fail, the goal is to succeed faster, and that they're different things. And that's absolutely what we're doing. And the way we succeed faster is by sharing those 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 failures. Yeah, and one of my favorite sayings, you haven't failed until you've quit. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So here at Collective Campus, uh, we took a team from Sportsbet, a team of cross-functional people, through a Lean Startup Bootcamp um, uh, sometime last year. And yeah. essentially, it brought people together who never really worked together on, um, or on any product development um, at all. Um, we had designers, marketers, and all sorts of stuff. Um, yes. And it was really interesting to see how quickly they gelled and how quickly they picked up the value of prototyping um, and basically got an understanding of the Lean Startup uh, process in, yes. in one day. But on that, um, how important is it to bring together uh, people with cross-functional uh, talents and skill sets when it comes to um, innovation? It's the only way. that you, you cannot do it any other way. And cross-functional means diverse, diversity of thinking, gender, nationality, um, background, all those things together, I think you get a much better outcome. And I think the legacy lives on from the training, by the way. Um, of course. So <laughs> six or, about 10 months later, um, those people have been just gone back into their different business units, missing innovation terribly, I'm, I'm sure. Of but um, it's been interesting to see the change in those individuals as they, they, they now question everything, they think with, from a different framing, and they've started to spread that sort of approach through the business. And yeah, and that's the thing about learning these philosophies. It's not just for product development teams, but essentially it's going to, um, in this um, fast-moving environment, serve you well throughout the business. Yes. Um, essentially, you're going to challenge the status quo more, ask more questions, find ways to um, to experiment where previously perhaps the, you didn't see one and you ended up spending too much money on something. Um, I mean, it essentially helps provide people with um, or, it's, or at least enable people's innovative DNA, as Chris, Clayton Christensen calls it, um, yes. you know, questioning, networking, observing, um, challenging the status quo, and so on, which is absolutely critical to um, entrepreneurial thinking. Just to touch quickly on that, um, one of the victories, I think, was a few months ago, uh, someone from Custom Operations popped out a Lean Canvas, wow. which was awesome to see, because it's a part of the business you would think that is just a done deal, yeah, process and driven. it's been great to see them go, we need to adjust this process, how do we do it? Let's step back, put ourselves in the customer's shoes, use the lean canvas, and then decide whether to do it or not. So that was really interesting to see. And that's the great thing about these tools, you know, they don't necessarily need to be used on um, 
uh, hashtag innovation projects yes. and the like. <laughs> I mean, they can be used on, well, not only different parts of the business, but everyday life. Um, Absolutely. I like to use the strategy campus from Blue Ocean Strategy, you know, um, do more, do less, start doing, stop doing, yes. um, to essentially help me optimize um, basically every day. Um, but anyway, when when you took the role with Sportsbit, we caught up and you, half jokingly, I guess, told me that if you still had a job with Sportsbit in two years' time, then you haven't done your job. How's that tracking? <laughs> um, firstly, I wasn't joking. And secondly, I've had the conversation with almost everyone in the business. And the reason I say that is it would mean that we have stagnated and that we haven't innovation has got two focuses in sports fit. One is how do we drive sustainable competitive advantage, uh, which is, and, and plug external thinking into the business. But the second part is how do we embed this culture and method and approach and thinking deeply into the business? So if I look back in two years time and I'm still in the innovation team, heading this up and, and treading water, um, I will have failed. Um, I think it needs to, it'll morph rapidly into some other version of this. So it may be, we may be of an external incubator. We may be doing all sorts of other interesting things. So, and the other thing is, if I'm not, one of my KPIs for myself is if they don't threaten to fire me every three months, I'm not trying hard enough. <laughs> so you're due for a firing soon? Mission accomplished. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, end of September. End of I'm September? Okay, one. we'll have to check in then and see how you're going. <laughs> So, Les, you're lucky enough to be going to the Singularity University Global Summit next month in September. Yes. And like yourself, I'm a huge fan of Peter Diamandis and all of his works. So, I just have to say that right now, I am just super jealous. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying – I'm a massive fan of Peter Diamandis. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been trying to get to this for years now, so I'm really pleased about it. Yep. Um, but the reason I'm a fan is, is I love the thinking that says you can't participate – in the conversation at Singularity University, if you're not thinking about how your idea impacts a billion people. Mm. So, I th and the reason I'm going is I want more of that injected into my thinking. It's like, yeah. you know, we think we're thinking at scale. We absolutely, we aren't, we're not even trying. Mm. So, so, so the ability to rally forces around that, create things like, I, I believe Peter Romanus is thinking seeded Elon Musk's space program and all that kind of thinking that it's actually possible for a non-government agency to build the stuff that we've considered the domain of government. Yeah, yeah. And it's like um, Peter Diamandis says, you know, if you want to um, make a billion dollars, then impact a billion people. Um, Absolutely. And on the um, private enterprises doing much more than large administrative uh, governments and bureaucracies, um, you just look at what Elon Musk did with SpaceX, um, the Dragon uh, rocket basically yes. – cost about 330 times less per vehicle than the um, Orion from NASA. Um, and it just goes to show you what an uh, organization with a culture of uh, moving fast, experimentation, um, a relentless focus on customer problems, and uh, no a lack of fear of failing publicly. Um, it just goes to show you what they can do with much less. Well, absolutely. And you want to see – I did a brief talk on failure, which is probably a conversation for another podcast. But – um, using Elon Musk as the demonstration. So it's always easy to start a presentation with rockets exploding <laughs> um, because you get your audience engaged. And they had two massive explosions on their, their re-landing attempt um, and the third one stuck. And if, you know, uh, and that's, that's putting it on the line and that is failure at scale. They blew up, I think, $110, $120 million worth of their customer's equipment in the process and they retained the customer. So, you know, if you think you're innovating, try harder. Yeah, and I think there's a massive piece there on um, on failure. Um, you know, we look at Elon Musk. I think it was after the third time the Falcon uh, blew up. He basically got the troops together and said, look, I don't know about you, but I will never give up. Yes. And they more or less just got straight back to work. You know, he's got that innate ability to um, inspire people to just continue going after those moonshots, which many of us would find um, – would not even consider. On that, um, the next 10 years, Les, promise to be a decade of great upheaval for many industries. I mean, we've got the coalescence of so many emerging technologies, which are, you know, at, at a point now where we may see mainstream um, uptake of things like artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, virtual reality, where we're, Augmented reality, I mean, I mean, we see the Pokemon Go craze um, at the moment, um, self-driving cars and so on. So 
it's an incredibly exciting but also scary time. So, um, I mean, what are you most interested in or most excited by um, in the next 10 years, Les? I think um, virtual reality is going to fundamentally change the way we engage with the world around us and with each other um, and possibly shift us into an environment where we're dissatisfied with reality reality. Um, I also think artificial intelligence, um, part of the reason I'm, I'm interested in going to this conference is Ray Kurzweil speaking. Wow. So that'll be amazing. His singularity is near. Absolutely. So I think artificial intelligence um, is going to progress rapidly from everything I'm reading. Um, and I think that's going to impact us in ways we can't even begin to understand. Um, as I read in a book, um, us understanding artificial superintelligence is the same as try us trying to explain uh, wireless to a spider. Like We can't even contextualize what this could look like. So I think we're in for an interesting ride. Yeah, well, we may essentially become subservient to robots. Um, but I guess there's a lot of talk about will AI and blockchain and so on create a new or create enough wealth for us to essentially not have to work to, to have a new social contract? Or will it just be the end of us as a species? Um, the best theory I've read, I think from Wait But Why, um, the blog, uh, from Tim Urban, is that we on the, this is just another step in the evolutionary path. So it goes from humanity to technology. Um, whether that's good or bad for us, not sure. <laughs> um, well, we probably won't be around long enough to see that unless um, Peter Diamandis gets his wish and um, we live long enough to live forever. But there's one final question before we get to the informalities, shall we say. Um, I recently interviewed Chris Cotano, who wrote the book Age of Discovery, and we're talking about the abundance that artificial intelligence and blockchain might create for us. Um, but the question was, well, we already have abundance, it's just not uh, evenly distributed. So um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, from Peter Demonis' book, Bold, a similar thought. Um, absolutely agree. Uh, look, you look around, you look in Australia, we're really, really lucky to live in this country. There's amazing abundance everywhere. There's, we, we don't have constraints, we don't have we don't really have big problems here, um, and everything's um, not in the right place. So there's there's more than enough food in the world. It's just not in the places that are starving. There's more than enough water. We've got you know 97% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. We just don't know how to get the salt out of it yet um, at scale. So I think we're rapidly moving towards that. Yeah, exactly. And I saw a great post the other day about new uh, water desalination technologies that can essentially take dirty water and make it clean. Yeah, the carbon fiber yeah, yeah. or some some yeah, there was some material that does it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's got amazing um, applications in um, developing economies, especially in Africa and parts of Asia, um, and essentially making water um, or access to water uh, an abundant resource, um, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, but anyway, that does it for our formalities today, Les. And I know you're a fan of this show. I know you've listened to a few of our episodes before, so I'm expecting you to perhaps have had a thought about our three lightning round questions. Are you ready? Yes. Excellent. Well, let's do it. <laughs> So question number one, Les, if you could work for any company at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? It would have to be SpaceX. Um, a, because I want to get into suborbital space before I take my last breath. That's one of my, my goals. Um, and I think you could work in that environment for two or three years and learn 50 years worth of things. Um, you'd probably burn out and I think it'd be crazy working for Elon Musk. But uh, your mind would be altered forever. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right about that rapid learning curve with the likes of Elon Musk. So question number two, Les. If you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Good question. Um, I'm a huge fan, it might be surprising, so I'm a huge fan of Brad Fell. Um, I think he's really, he comes across as a really balanced, thoughtful, founder-friendly person. And I love the way that he approaches the, this early stage ecosystem holistically and the fact that he you know, does a lot of talking and knowledge and training and that. So the question would probably be, um, how does he find balance? I think balance is really important at a personal and professional level. 
So for those in our audience who don't know who Bradfeld is, he is the founder of Techstars, the world's one of the world's largest startup accelerators, and we had the head of the London campus, um, Max Kelly, on the show, and that's episode number 48, so check that out. Um, so finally, Les, question number three. I know you like to take care of yourself, you seem like a fit guy, you've got a lot going on in the innovation space, um, and also writing and maintaining your own blog. So question is, do you have any rituals or routines to help you stay on top of your game? Absolutely. So I believe that I've got to look after my body, which is the engine for my brain, <laughs> uh, which sounds a bit trite. But um, so yeah, a lot of rec- real exercise. I use, I spend a lot of time listening to podcasts like Andrew Norwich, Horowitz's A16Z. I'm a big fan of that. This podcast, of course. And, and multiple others um, and I use my gym time to do that so maximize that, that, that time I, I read a huge amount so I read two or three books a week um, on all sorts of subjects because <laughs> I don't know if I'm a speed reader but um, so the goal isn't to get to the end the goal is to learn and uh, my outlook on life is just constant learning it's like whatever I, I'm a voracious reader and listener and consumer of stuff at the same time I also try and um, blog on a regular basis on my blog InsideInnovation.co, um, and the reason I do that isn't for an audience. It's the best advice I got was it isn't about how many people are reading it. It's just to put your thoughts into a place that they become coherent, and you can understand them and internalize them yourself. And I know you're a big fan of doing that kind of thing. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm absolutely a big fan of blogging, and actually, um, spent a bit of time the other day writing um 50 lessons from 50 episodes, that, um, yes. which was all about essentially taking the learnings from my first 50 episodes and putting them down on paper. And I find when you do that, you're much more likely to retain things because um, we tend to consume a lot of knowledge, but not really digest it the way we should. Um, yeah. So taking the time out to reflect and say, well, what did I actually learn here? Maybe put some thoughts down on paper helps you retain that knowledge quite a bit more. And on um, blogging, I think Seth Godin basically, he, he blogs once a day and he says that if you write a blog that has an audience of one, i.e. yourself, and you just love writing, um, then you're already ahead of 95% of bloggers. Um, so if, you've, if you're enjoying what you're writing, then you're, you're doing pretty well. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Fantastic, Les. So um, our audience members can track your innovation journey at insideinnovation.co. Is there anywhere else they can go to find out a little bit more about yourself and connect? Yep, um, so I'm quite active on Twitter. It's at Leslie C. Barry. And happy to hook up and connect with anybody. Also pretty active on LinkedIn. And just a comment on the blog. The blog is just my perspective of the world. But the purpose of it, I think, is to attract more people to the space to think about how do we connect startups to business. So if you want to comment or jump on that or do something around it that's great happy to work with you excellent well we'll make sure to include that in the show notes for our listeners um well thank you so much les you've been an awesome guest um i guess in 14 months time we'll be expecting to have you back on here talking about the journey beyond sports bet if you hold true to your uh, two-year plan (laughs) thank you steve i really appreciate it thanks for having me today and i'm looking forward to seeing you go to episode number 100 or 200 or 300 looking forward to it cheers thanks steve Well, that's it for my chat with Leslie Barry from Sportsbet. Hope you enjoyed uh, listening to that as much as I interviewed taking part. Um, Of course, you can find out a little bit more about Sportsbet's eSports offering at respawn.sportsbet.com.au. You can hit up Leslie on Twitter at Leslie C. Barry and check out his blog, insideinnovation.co. So we've got a ton of other things going on at Collective Campus, which you can find out a little bit more about at collectivecamp.us forward slash events and forward slash class as well if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the Lean Startup, about design thinking, about agile, customer experience design, data science, digital marketing, or even web development. There's a ton of resources on our website, um, physical delivery, online delivery, and so on. So make sure you take a bit of time to um, check that out, inform yourself, and upskill. Because in the fast-moving world that we find ourselves in, we simply can't afford to sit back and 
And don't forget, later this month, on August 31st, we'll be hosting Ash Moria, author of Running Lean, um, and also the creator of the Lean Canvas, which um, Leslie Barry alluded to a few times in this show. Um, so you can pick up a ticket uh, to that show at collectivecamp.us forward slash events as well. I think it's only about $10 to get a ticket to that, but you can also live stream that one from free, for free rather, from any corner of the globe. Um, and as I mentioned in the podcast, I've recently published a blog post called 50 Lessons from 50 Episodes, where you can basically um, extract morsels of knowledge from our first 50 episodes, um, and that can be found at collectivecamp.us forward slash blog forward slash 50 lessons if you're picking up what we're putting down if you're liking what we're putting out there please take a minute to um, show some love on iTunes SoundCloud or Stitcher five star rating a subscription or even sharing this with your friends would be much appreciated by myself and the team here at Collective Campus who work tirelessly to bring you amazing content um, time and time again so so we would always appreciate a little bit of love Um, until next time Future Squared, out.